Deuteronomy is where we're going to be today, and Deuteronomy chapter 6, it's the fifth book in the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then Deuteronomy, and so while you're making your way there, I ask you a question, do you believe God has a long-range plan for your life? Yeah, absolutely, he has a long-range plan for your life. It's a, it's a plan that reaches all the way into eternity. It's not just for what you feel today, it's not just for this season, it's not just, in fact, it's not just for your lifetime. God has a much longer plan for you than that. It reaches all the way into eternity, and it reverberates out after you're gone from planet Earth. If planet Earth is still here, your, your life still touches lives and still touches circumstances because there's a legacy element to, uh, to walking with God. Here's, uh, here's what the Apostle Paul said to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 4. He says, for our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. Now, when he talks about small and won't last very long, he's talking about troubles. And, and for the people feeling them, for what Paul was feeling at that stage of his journey, uh, they, they didn't feel so small. And they felt like they'd gone on for way too long. Some of you are in a situation today where you say, they don't feel small. It doesn't feel uh, like it's going to go away anytime soon. But compared to eternity, that's the message he gives us. Compared to eternity, there's a, glory out, there's a glory out there waiting for you as a believer in Christ that far outweighs whatever you're experiencing today. And then, in the book of Romans, under the same kind of theme, talking about the painful experiences of our lives, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And here's the idea, that what's happening today is going to impact tomorrow. It's going to impact the future. Uh, all the way into eternity, that there's a correlation between what we're experiencing now and the eternity we will experience. There's a correlation between what we're experiencing now and what's going to happen in the lives that in our circles of influence around us, that it reverberates out into the world. So, it is true that what you do with your life, with your day-to-day, -day, touches eternal things, reverberates out across the years, and that is your legacy. And you're creating one every day. And it's, it's not just the, the big events. It's not just the, uh, the landmark things that happen that create a legacy. A legacy is not something that just happens at the end of your life. But it's an ongoing investment over time, over years, and particularly in your circles of influence, most most applicable within your own family, within beyond, to your friends, to your neighbors, to the people you work with, the, the random people you're going to run into in the course of a day. The people, uh, the people you're going to spend a significant part of your life with. Now, Jesus says in Revelation 22, Behold, I'm coming soon, bringing my recompense, my reward with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And I hear that. I am coming soon. And uh, I join in also uh, just a few verses on down in Revelation 22 where, <laughs> where John says, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. You feel any of that? Oh, Jesus coming again. Even so, oh, come, Lord Jesus. I, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. This world is so broken and it's so ready. And I pray it would be soon. And I believe his coming will be soon. However, I'll say this too. The first century church thought it was going to be soon. They, they thought at any moment Jesus was going to return. But here's what's different from them and a lot, of, a lot of folks today who are saying, oh, I'm ready for Jesus to come, is they had ordered their lives accordingly. They were living life, making choices. They, they, were, they, were, they were doing the acts of obedience that you'd expect from somebody who really expected. They were about to meet the Savior face to face. They were about to give an account for their life for eternity. So they were a little different than how we do it today. There's a lot of speculation about when Jesus is going to come back. It's a multi-billion dollar industry in Christian subculture. And I could take a lot of it more seriously if I saw more people who were ordering their lives accordingly in the process, who were living as if they expected, I, I really am about to meet my Savior. Now, I pray Jesus will come again soon. But 
What if? What if, like with the early church, it's centuries yet? What if? It's not immediate. What if, in God's uh, perfect timing, in God's perfect plan, there is more to be done? Then not only as far as what my eternity is going to be like in relationship to legacy, but what is my ongoing legacy going to be that's going to reverberate out from me between here and wherever that there, or the finish line of time, wherever that is, what is that legacy going to look like? What difference is going to be made in the world because I had left some footprints on it at this point in my life? I can just guarantee you this, your life will touch the future. That's true for every one of us. I heard this story from a pastor a few years back, and it uh, fascinated me, uh, historically and otherwise. So, in 2014, this pastor, he was in a mission trip, and he was in Ethiopia. And while in Ethiopia, he was told a story about a missionary from Ethiopia who went to Pakistan. Okay, there are a lot of places you can go as a missionary. Pakistan is not real high on most people's list of, here's a good place to go and tell people about Jesus. Not because there's not a lot of need, but because there's a lot of danger. And uh, the people in Pakistan don't embrace... uh, Christian missionaries. So, this guy from Ethiopia, he goes to Pakistan. God really leads him to this one particular town, and he does what seems uh, unimaginable. Rather than trying to fly under the radar of what he's about and who he is, uh, like we do in a lot of places that are difficult places to share the gospel in the world, he, he got together with the town leaders, and he said, I'm from Ethiopia. I'm a missionary. I'm here to share the gospel and plant a Christian church in this town. Okay, now that's like a death warrant most of the time in Pakistan. But here is what the city leaders said in response. You may do your work here. We owe you the gift of openness and hospitality because your people gave asylum to Muhammad's family 1,400 years ago. Okay, now that's the craziest story ever. What in the world? Well, this pastor, he had to dig into that one for a while to figure out what in the world is he talking about? We're, we're going to welcome a Christian missionary into our overwhelmingly Muslim culture and community because, because some Ethiopians were nice to Muhammad's family 1,400 years ago. And so this is the story. Muhammad, during his lifetime, it really his life gets divided into two pieces. There's one point where he doesn't have a lot of followers, he doesn't have a lot of influence. And so on that front end of uh, Muhammad's life, he is under a lot of persecution from the, the pagan tribes that he so opposed, the pagan tribes in the Arabian Peninsula. And they, they pushed him out, and he had to gather up his family and go to, for refuge he went to Ethiopia, and there was an Ethiopian king named Nagash. And Nagash welcomed, a Christian uh, there in Ethiopia, welcomed Muhammad and his family uh, to be among them as a refugee and cared for them until they, they after time, went back. And uh, Muhammad then gained uh, power over the Arabian Peninsula and and uh, Islam was really uh, fully born. But here's the, here's the deal. This king, uh, Nagash, he was known as a Christian king who refused bribe, granted sanctuary to fleeing Muslims. And Muhammad, he never forgot King Nagash. And he talked about it. And he, re- he told the story. And so the Hadith is the teachings of Muhammad It's part of their sacred writings, and in there, this story is reflected. Now, most Muslims aren't paying much attention to it uh, in the world, I think, or else we need to send a whole lot more Ethiopians out into the Muslim world. But because it's in the sacred writings, a Pakistani mayor and his uh, city council declared that this Christian missionary who showed up randomly in our town, we owe it to him to freely share the gospel of Jesus Christ and plant a church in our Muslim city because of what some Christians in Ethiopia did 1,400 years ago. Now, 
Do you think that those Christians saw that coming? Like King Nagash and his, uh, his Ethiopian Christian brothers and sisters, they said, you know, if we're nice to this guy, there's going to be a missionary 1,400 years from now that's going to get to tell people about Jesus in a place that no one gets to tell people about Jesus w- without serious repercussions. No. But they just did what was right in the moment. They did what would honor Christ in the moment. And as a result, God opens a door and God, God, uh, God is at work. Listen, one of the things I want you to be sure and hear today is that what we do in the name of Jesus, whether it's a big something or it seems to be an inconsequential small something, it's never wasted in God's hands. He doesn't waste anything. It, it, it all goes for his glory and it all touches Touches eternity and our acts. And goodness, so I'm a pastor and I get to be on the front end of a lot of things where I, I see God doing things and I get to hear the stories of how God's at work here, there, and everywhere through the life of our church family and kingdom work around through Christians I know far and wide. But most of the time, the things that I'm just doing day to day, I, I don't see Well, let's see. Here's a direct cause effect. I shared this, and here's the result. I moved this forward, and here's a great consequence as a result that that just blows the kingdom of God doors wide open. Well, most of the time, I don't don't see that. Uh, Most of us don't see that. Because we talked about this last Sunday. So much of the Christian life is planting seeds. And you may or may not be be there at harvest time. You may or may not be there when, when it all comes together. And the plan is fully born. But you plant seeds. Uh, another, another image is uh, dropping a pebble in the ocean. Well, you, you, you drop your pebbles one little bit at a time. And you, you don't know. It's, it's not moving the, moving the ocean anywhere. But there are ripples that come out from it. And it's in those ripples that God, God is Lord of the ripples. He's Lord of the seed planting. And it's in those small things, the stewardship of small things, that great eternal things happen, things beyond what we could ever ask or imagine, beyond what we could have ever constructed in our own plans that God would accomplish. And your legacy, how you, the impact you're going to have on the world, and how you'll be remembered by the people who know you best, love you most, so much of legacy is about daily investment. It's, it's one pebble at a time. And it's one, one seed planted at a time that results in, in, in great harvest and great kingdom of God impact in the future. We talk a lot about legacy. A lot of people don't think about it until the end of their life. They get down to the end and say, well, I need to start thinking about my legacy. What am I going to do uh, to be remembered, to leave my touch on the world? Well, your legacy begins way, way back before the end. And it's one pebble, one seed at a time. And those things add up and add up and add up. That's how this works. Uh, we always hear it when, a, when there's a change in uh, presidents. So President Obama, that last year of his presidency, you remember, a lot of things in the news. Same thing when Bush, last year of his eight years. Y- you saw all these news reports about, oh, he's trying to protect his legacy. He's trying to establish his legacy. Man, you don't do that in the last year of your presidency. You, you, that, that's an investment that happens over time, happens over the course of a life. And even out and they're out of office, sometimes presidents of the United States, their greatest legacy is not what they did during their years in office. It's what they did after they were in office. What is your legacy? It's a daily investment. And I want to look at a daily investment passage, one of my favorites ever from Deuteronomy. By the way, I gave you all that time to find the fifth book in the Bible. Just in case you're working on your Bible finding skills here in the beginning of the year. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and here we go. Now this, verse 1, chapter 6 of Deuteronomy. Now this is the commandment, the statutes, the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. That you may do them in the land in which you are going over to possess it. That you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you today, all the days of your life. 
and that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you, in a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words which I command you today shall be upon your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall, wear, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now, when the book of Deuteronomy comes around, historically, the Israelites are about to enter the promised land. So the 40 years of wilderness wandering are coming to a close. And now Moses is about to pass off of the scene. He's about to hand off the baton to Joshua. They're on the threshold of entering the land of promise at long last. So Deuteronomy is, is the teaching of Moses. Just the, bleh, here are all the things I still need to tell you. All the things I need to remind you of. All the things that you may have forgotten. All the things that you need to carry with you into the land of of promise. He wants to establish a foundation for a lasting society and really a legacy that's going to reach well beyond himself or beyond their generation. Chapter 5 of Deuteronomy, Moses again repeats the Ten Commandments. Chapter 6, he gives this foundation. Uh, this is what it means to be a person of success in relationship to God. This is what it means to be a people of spiritual legacy. And this is true of an individual. It's true of a family. It's true of a people, uh, for them, a nation. And it's also true, just right relationship to God. What does right relationship to God look like? Deuteronomy spells it out really well. It's the same thing you're going to find in the New Testament. It's not overly complex. It often boils down to two things. That's how Jesus sum summarized. This is, what it, this is what it's about, right relationship to God. And where does right relationship to God come from? It's whatever we want it to be, right? It's however we self-define right relationship. Isn't that what right relationship to God is? It's however I do it. That's, what the, that's the right way to know. God defines right relationship. I don't define it. My society certainly doesn't define it. God defined in his word, this is what right relationship to him looks like. This is how it's lived out. This is what it should reflect. Then, the second thing, right relationship to other people. Now, what does that look like? Well, it's whatever works for me. Well, no, of course not. It's not whatever works for me. It's not what my society says is okay. It's not what my closest friends tell me. What right relationship to other people looks like is what God has said. How God said to live in relationship to other people. Because God's word is true and God's word is authoritative. And so at our church, that's how we're going to approach this. Because See, this is the This Is Us series. This is who we are. This is what defines us compared to the rest of the world or maybe some other faith groups. This is us, and this is us says God's word is going to be authoritative. We'll spend a whole Sunday uh, just on that part of the story. What does right relationship to God look like? What does right, right relationship to other people look like? When you get to verse 4, you get to the Shema. It's the confession of faith of Judaism. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. That's the Shema. Shema is a Hebrew word. It means hear. Many of you know that already. It means hear. It's something that uh, the faithful Jewish people would have said every day. It's something that they would say as they were getting the uh, Torah, the, the law, out of the ark to be read in the synagogue service. Uh, they would declare the Shema during that time. And it's summarized this way, just a simple way to think about it. You need to know God in your innermost being. It's a heart thing. That faith is a relationship that relates to the totality of life. It's not just a piece here, a piece there, a piece there. It's the whole life. You organize your entire life around the sovereignty of God. God's in charge and you're not. And you love God with all you are, all you have. You offer it up to Him. So success in life, legacy living, comes from building the right stuff into your life. And this is a good summary of uh, foundational things that Moses gives to the people of Israel, gives to us, that you live this life in your circles of influence, and you're going to have a legacy that's 
It's going to be passed on and worth being passed on. So how do you build this stuff into life? Three things. And the reason there are three things is because I do not have four. Number one. We'll build up. We're going to start with three because the first Sunday of the new year. By the end of the year, we'll be into 30 and 40 point sermons. First thing, this legacy is built on obedience to God. Now, we do a lot of talking about uh, what God said. Like, oh, yeah, I know. I've studied the Bible. A lot of people study the Bible because we have a knowledge-based Christianity largely in our culture where it's all about knowing the right answer. I know what I should do. I know what I should do. I know what I should do. There's a difference between... Between knowledge and obedience. One is sin. You stick it, you stick it in your head, but it never gets to your heart and flows out of, out of your life. In obedience, that's that's sin. We want to get to the obedience side of this. You know, I heard I heard a story a long time ago. One of my favorites all, all, always because I preached in some of these churches, small country church, sweet, uh, loving people, and uh, pastor been there a long time. He uh, was preaching on sin, and that's the darkness of disobedience to God, and he just really let fly, kind of a blistering sort of sermon for these folks, and he's looking out there, you know, just a lot of sweet people, simple people, and uh, he felt bad about it after he was done. They listened attentively and all, but after the service, he just, you know, he went, as was his custom, went to the back door of the little country church. Everybody passed by and shook his hand. And he just took each person's hand as they came by and he said, nothing personal, nothing personal, nothing personal, nothing personal. Uh, I think that's probably at least part of the problem in our sin-stained world is that uh, way too many people who name the name of Christ, they're not taking much of it personally. Uh, we, we we just take it at, at arm's length. It's, it's something out there. It's not something in here. And we, we need to take it more personally. I know a lot of adult Christians who say, you yeah, know, I respect God. I appreciate God. I admire God. I, I know a lot about God. I, I know that God loves me. But there are just fewer and fewer Christ followers in our world who who can really say and, and actually mean it. I love God. With all my heart, I love God with all my soul. I love God with all my mind. I love God with all my strength. Uh, we need more of those Christ followers who are living the life of obedience. We need to put this into our hearts and really believe it. And, and not cast it aside as, okay, yeah, read, read this in my Bible. It's just a cute thought for the day. I'm looking for the thing that just encourages me and makes me feel good about me. This message of the good news of Jesus Christ and his sacrificial love for us and what he did at the cross, it ought to burn in our hearts in a way that, bur- that, that blows out into the world around us, that overflows. We have a whole generation, and this is a, you see this in the news all the time, a whole generation of young adults who say, ah, I don't believe in this anymore. I'm, I'm not following this anymore. I don't trust any of this anymore. And you say, why don't our, why don't our children believe it except our faith, the faith of their parents, the faith of their grandparents, and the biggest indicator through the studies that are coming out now is that they've just never seen it lived out by anybody they knew. They didn't see it in their parents, they didn't see it in their grandparents, it's something that was really more than just a religious activity, they didn't see it in in the other influential Christian adults that were around them, they they, they saw the hypocrisy, they saw the breakdowns, and when, when we will live this like we really believe it, I think that the next generation will see it and there'll be a legacy that's going to endure because of it. Second thing, and t- so, so closely tied to it because the whole passage leans this way, this is a legacy built on sharing God's truth across generations, from generation to generation. And that's what this passage is about. These verses teach us a much neglected fact about family, and that is the primary teacher of uh, spiritual things, yeah, that environment is supposed to be the family environment. Church will partner with you. We'll encourage it. We'll resource you. Uh, we, we'll hold hands with you in doing this, but, but parents have a charge from God to deliver and teach God's truth to the next generation. Now, children are being pushed in a lot of different things, pulled a lot of different ways. There's so many responsibilities kids have, so much, so much this weight on them these days. They have a thousand and one things on their calendar and uh, so 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 busy and it's academics and it's athletics and 
a whole lot of good things. Uh, but in the middle of all that, we just assume that somehow the spiritual stuff is still getting taken care of. Or that the spiritual things will happen regardless. But it's the one thing that will not happen by accident. It has to be intentional. And if this doesn't become intentional, the, the, the whole system starts to break down. That God entrusts to us these young lives that we might teach them. Uh, there's a story about a little girl. She came to her mother and said, Mom, you remember the, that, that special vase we have? I said, oh, yeah, special vase, sure. The one in the china cabinet? Yeah, the one that, yeah, that's where we keep it in the china cabinet. Had it for a long time, been in the family for a long time. The daughter said, yeah, you said it's been passed from generation to generation. Yeah, passed from generation to generation. Mom, I'm sorry, but this generation just dropped that vase. Some earthly possessions have sentimental value, and to break them is a great loss. And I just want to say, how much more tragic is it that the gospel not go forward to the next generation? The next generation not, not receive the life-changing message of Jesus. That, that we fail to pass along a godly heritage to the next generation. Because some of those things start touching eternal loss. The people of God are always one generation away from away from the faith ending. As Moses says all this. Joshua leads him into the promised land. You know, the, the most chilling verse in the whole Bible is about Judges 2.10. And after Joshua dies, it says, there rose a generation after him who did not know God nor the things he had done. A whole generation. At the baton, from a generation that saw the conquest of the promised land, a whole generation that then comes up Somehow, mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, just never got around to passing that part on to the next generation. One generation away from extinction. That's true of the people of God. It's true within a family heritage. Our kids are under attack. Just so many inputs, so many uh, technology has uh, just opened a floodgate on our kids. And no amount of great parenting guarantees a child's going to love Jesus uh, and not make bad choices. But parents, we are not powerless in this battle. Moses paints a picture of the things of God being a normal part of family life. And somehow we, uh, we get apologetic about talking about Jesus in our own home sometimes. Or with the people that are our friends. The people in our circles of influence. You don't ever have to apologize for Jesus. You can talk about Jesus because if it's a part of your life, it's going to be overflowing anyway. And more than just by your example of moral living, there are a lot of people who have no relationship to Christ at all who are good moral people. But when your relationship to Christ is there, that ought to be a part of conversation. It ought to be flowing out. And that's the description that we get here, that this teaching is interspersed throughout the day. Uh, the, the key word, uh, my New American Standard, I'm using the ESV today, my New American Standard says, impress it upon your children. Well, I want my children just to grow up and make their own choices. And when they're old enough, they can choose. You're the only person that's letting them choose about relationship to God stuff. Everyone else is getting a lot of input on that. Mostly away from God. So why would you give up your voice when God's giving you such a strong voice? Impress it upon your children. You make them do, your, do their homework. What about spiritual things? You ought to be pushing forward in that area too. When they're young and, and don't stop talking to them when, I don't know, when they're a teenager rolling their eyes. They're still hearing it. A lot more than they want to give you credit for. When they're young adults, when they're median adults, don't give up your voice to the things of God. For our children, especially the younger children, though, they know it's important to you. Uh, they, know, they know what you really believe because they've seen you act it out at home. And uh, when they see the real deal in you, they don't have difficulty accepting it, making their faith, your faith their faith. So... During my morning prayer time for a long time, and I still, I keep this in my prayer list, even though my kids are adults now, uh, I still ask God, God, give me sensitivity to teachable moments today with my children. And wherever that comes, and some days I have more touch than others because of their, uh, what they're up to and what they're, uh, where they are. But I, I don't ever want to give up that voice into my kid's life. And so I'm always going to be uh, utilizing that voice. God, give me sensitivity to say it right, the teachable moments in their life. And I talked to, talk about God. I'm talking about prayer. 
When my kids talk about what's going on in their life, I, I want to pray for them, pray with them, tell them what I'm learning from God's Word. That, that's just a part of the conversation. And what, what Moses says is, it ought to be the ongoing part of conversation. That verse 7 is such a great verse. Teach about it when you're at home, when you're between home and wherever you're heading, just on your commute. Well, some of my best conversations with my kids, especially when they were younger, and now that they are older, so my best conversation is in the car. It's the weirdest thing ever. But they'll share more stuff, tell more stuff in the car than any other time. And so that commuting time, that's a big deal. And I tell them, we're in an air-conditioned or a heated car instead of on the back of a donkey or something, whatever they were having to do on their commute. you got a pretty good deal going here in the modern world. We talk about Jesus. We point to the creation. Uh, it's the small things of just being a bit. When you get up, on your commute, when you go to bed, when you rise, Whenever it is, whatever you're doing, make God a part of your conversation. Because if Jesus is a part of your life, the Lord is a part of your life, it ought to be spilling over into everything, and especially with the people who know you best, love you most, people closest around you. It's important to seek out opportunities to teach our children. Now, uh, I came across this book years ago, and I, I, you can find my books, and if I read them at the gym, they're, uh, they're dog-eared pages. So you can tell how good a book is by how many pages are dog-eared. That's my, that's my personal book review. I do this at the gym, and I can still on my elliptical or whatever I'm doing, I can, I can dog-ear pages and mark things with my fingernail. It's a very complex process. But this book, Spiritual Ecology, is written in 1990 by a guy named Jim Nolman. And though I think this is the only thing out of the whole book that I marked. But it said, the, uh, this comes from... The great law of the, it's the Six Nation Iroquois Confederacy, uh, Iroquois Indians. And their tribe recognized their obligation to the next generation. And this is, so this is in their law, this is written, and it is, it's fantastic. It says, in our every deliberation, we must consider the impact of our decisions on the next seven generations. Well, how big's your vision? How big's your vision for you? How big's your vision for your family? Uh, for the next seven generations is how they did it. You know, it's time for each of us to really take inventory of our responsibilities toward the generations to come and begin impressing godliness on our children, uh, a love for Jesus on our children, and, and not apologizing for it ever with an unreserved determination. We just want people to know him and love him. Here's the third thing. A legacy built on faithfulness to God lived out daily. <laughs> daily. The verse says, put the scripture everywhere. When you think about these things, put it everywhere. Now, there were some people that uh, by the time we get to Jesus' time, you have Pharisees and they have these long robes and they have these little boxes and they put scripture inside the boxes and they'd tie it to their, to their clothing. So they'd have, I've always got the scripture with me. They do the same thing with the doorposts of their house. They tie little boxes to the entrance of their homes. There's some scripture there. Now that's symbolic things. I'm all about symbolic things. We have symbolic things all over our home and have all these years. There's certain scriptures, there's symbols that remind us of Jesus, remind us of who we are in Christ, uh, remind us of the truth of God's word. And so do those things most definitely. I don't need a box on my clothing. I need, I need God's word in my heart much more than I need it uh, in some public showy way. But all those things show whose side you're on. That's a pretty good deal sometimes. But it's not just the literalism and the legalism that's required. Yeah, and find all those ways, but the essence of it is that there is an inner devotion that, res that results in an outward expression of your faith. That your love for Jesus is just going to spill out into the world. It's going to overflow, not because you're thinking, ooh, I haven't overflowed my faith anywhere today, but because it's just the natural thing that happens in the heart of somebody who belongs to Jesus. It's a story. I love goofy stories. This is a goofy story. A story about a little boy. He's old elementary school, country town, country church, and he uh, showed up for Sunday school a little late. The Sunday school teacher said, where have you been? And the boy said, well, I was all ready to go fishing today, but my dad said I had to go to Sunday school. Well, Sunday school teacher loved that story. And he was about to pontificate to the young boy and his friends about the importance of a father who's going to teach his son 
that you ought to be in the Lord's house on the Lord's day, and you shouldn't be skipping for something as trivial as fishing. And just before he got started, the little boy said, Yeah, Dad said there wasn't enough bait for both of us to go fishing. I tell you, I'd venture a guess that our children will tell us what is really important to us. And they watch us all the time. And if we want them to grow up knowing and loving God, they have to know we know and we love God. Uh, there's, a, there's a quote that grabs a piece of scripture that you're familiar with. Train up a child in the way he should go. Here's the rest of it. And go there yourself every once in a while. What does this look like in day-to-day life at your house? They can take on several different looks. Let me ask you a question. Please do not answer this out loud. This is one of those questions you should not answer out loud. Uh, have, you, have you ever, uh, you wake up on Sunday morning and your kids come to you? Have your kids ever said, hey, are we going to church today? Oh, man, your life has gone south if your kids ever ask you that question. Are we going to church today? My kids never ask me that question. And not because, not because I'm a pastor of a church their whole growing up life. They never asked me that question when we were on vacation. They never asked me that question when we were visiting family somewhere else. We're always going to be in the Lord's house on the Lord's day. That's not a question yes. A lot of families, though, they wake up on Sunday morning. If you wake up on Sunday morning and you're trying to decide on Sunday morning, are we going to church today? You're going to lose that battle nine times out of ten. That just needs to already be settled. <coughs> Some things need to be clear. Does your family pray? Do you pray together? Do you pray for each other? Have you ever asked your kids to pray for you? Especially as my kids have gotten older. But when they were young, I'd ask them, hey, I've got a meeting tonight. Would you pray for me that I'd have a good meeting? Give them what they need. Let them pray for you. Involve them in spiritual things in your spiritual life. Absolutely. Are you involved in ministry? Do your kids see you involved in ministry? Your kids ever done ministry with you, shoulder to shoulder with you? It's one of the most precious things you can share the next generation. Do your children see you growing in your walk with the Lord? Do they see you taking a next step? Do they see you expressing your heart of love for your God? Have your children ever heard you give your own story of how you came to faith in Christ? Have you shared your testimony with your own children and what it means to you and the difference it makes in you? It's a great place to practice with the people who are closest to you. Share your story of coming to know Jesus with the people who your family, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, tell, tell a story. Everybody loves a story. Hey, can I tell you a story? It changed my life. Can I tell you a story? It makes such a difference. Can I tell you a story when I was in the same kind of situation that so righted my ship when things were tough? Can I tell you a story? Have they ever heard you share the gospel with another person? Have they seen you with a Bible open? You reading your Bible? Have they heard you pray and know you're praying about big things? Maybe the greatest testimony would be to ask your children, what's your parents' highest priority? What do they value most? What are your parents, what's most important to them? Because I assure you they know the answer to that question. They know it early in life. They'll know what's important to you and what's not. Because they're watching you. I want to share something with you to close out. And uh, this is something, I look back and I shared it the first time about 15 years ago. It's something I keep in my prayer notebook. And occasionally I'll roll something out of my prayer notebook for you. Things that I put in front of me. But I was looking at kind of legacy type stuff. And what brought this back to mind is when I was writing this sermon, the week I was writing this sermon, I got a call from a younger pastor who was about the age I was when I came here. And he had uh, his uh, three preschoolers. And uh, we're just talking about ministry stuff. And it's just... It's just uh, It's a wild season for him, and he was thinking about all these different layers of what I do next and how to tackle this. And and, uh, I said, let me me give you just a word of testimony for this stage of your life, because I've been in that spot when it just felt like there was a lot on me and a lot of things as a young pastor and and with young kids. I told him my story that uh, I've repeated periodically with the staff, with others, One of these days, I'm going to pass from here. I don't know where I'll end up. You know, Rhonda and I, one of these days, may retire and we'll go off somewhere. We may stay here in North Texas. I don't know what we'll end up doing. And when I die, maybe maybe there'll be a good crowd that shows up at my funeral. Uh, 
although I plan to live to be about 125, so most of you be gone by then. But uh, the, one, the one thing I told him is that, you know, when I get to the end of me, if other people wanted to come and be a part of that memorial service, that'd be swell. But there really, there really is three people I'm really concerned about being there and still, st- still caring about me, and that's, that's Rhonda and Austin and Lauren. And I sure want them to be there and to be able to stand at my graveside. And I want them to know that their dad really loved them and he really loved Jesus. And I want them to know that, <laughs> I hope that, you know, you know with, with them, that in spite of, you know, being in the middle of church world for their whole lives because of me, that they'd still really, really love Jesus and they'd still really love the local church. And they'd see that relationship to God is, uh, is a real deal. Uh, and it makes a difference in time and for eternity. And, and I hope that they'd sure be there. And then I wrote down some things about me. Uh, I think about my, you think about legacy. I think, okay, well, let's see. I've been involved. I've been here for 21 years now. I, I got brick and mortar things I can point to. And there are people I've led to Christ. And there are ministry things that I've carried out. And there are there are things that I celebrate and remember. And, uh, but when you, when you kind of wipe all that away, when I come to my last day, whatever my last day between here and eternity is, I get the last day. Well, this is the list I wrote for that day. And what I still want to be in place when I get to that day. And so uh, here's my run at it. It hasn't changed much since I wrote it about 15 years ago. When I get to that last day, I would hope, because by the way, I don't want to just run parts of this race well. I really want to finish this race well. And I've seen too many of my friends who didn't finish well. I pray that I would still believe, I'd still be believing (laughs) that a great commitment to the great commandment the Great Commission, or really grow a great Christian. And that I would finish with my integrity intact. And I pray that on that last day, the people who know me best would respect me most. And I pray that um, on that last day, I would still be getting surprised by God. He'd still be doing things that he's... And, I never saw that coming. I never would have imagined God would have orchestrated in that way. I never thought he could have brought things together in such a miraculous way. I pray, goodness, you've heard this from me for so very long, but I pray that on my last day, I would still know what my next step needs to be, and I'd be leaning into it. I'd be finding my next step with my Lord. I pray that my marriage vows on that last day would be all paid up. I would certainly hope on that last day that my kids would know that a faith in Jesus Christ, it really does work. You know, I'd pray, oh my goodness, I've read through my Bible so many times. and uh, This morning, I was reading in the first, the first uh, three chapters of Second Chron- uh, Second, Second, uh, Corinthians. And there was a verse... It just jumped off the page at me. And as many times as I have read it, I haven't thought about it the way I thought about it today, the way God spoke to me today. And I prayed that on my last day, the Bible stood just jumping off the page and grabbing a hold of me in, in dramatic ways. I would pray that my holy discontent, which God stirs from time to time, uh, is that, you know, God is my witness if I have any voice and I have any influence, this should not be. And this should be different than it is now. That holy discontent, that God would still be stirring holy discontent in my spirit and taking me new places. And I pray that my relationship to my wonderful wife 
uh, of these now 32 years, as of last month, would you still be fresh and, and blessed? She was telling me a story. She's not in here, is she? She was, she was telling me a story uh, last night when I went out to eat. And uh, it was just some crazy story. And I, I didn't hear a whole lot of the story. I was just looking at her thinking, man, I love her. That my children, wherever they are and whatever they're doing, would be serving and loving the God that their father served and loved and they would be passing on their faith. You know that I would be ashamed for what I do when no one else is going to know about it to be shouted in the streets? That I'd still be believing that the local church is the hope of the world because it's to the local church that God has entrusted the life-changing message of the gospel. And that I would still have on my last day this passion to see lost people found and to see found people formed into the image of Christ and to see formed people freed to serve and to share and to, to touch the world. And if 2017 was anything, it was a year of brokenness and so much of our world. But I pray that on my last day, I would still finish my race with an otherworldly optimism that in a broken, sinful world that leaves so much wreckage in lives, because of the life-changing power of Jesus Christ, nobody's story has to end like that. Your story does not have to end in broken. But God can save, he can refresh, he can renew, he can restore. He makes all things new. And nobody's story has to end in broken. Our legacy is about seeds and pebbles daily. And where we want to finish the race is largely determined by how we run today and tomorrow and the next day. Run well in 2018.